Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli, Chapter 31 Winter A dead leaf skittered in the moonlight as I wiggled my way through the two-brick hole to the other side. I took off my armband. I knew Janina was somewhere behind me. On this bitterly cold night, the streets of Warsaw were almost as deserted as those of the ghetto. But the Blue Camel Hotel was always bright and warm. As I sailed through the revolving door, I caught a glimpse of red hair in the lobby. I went around again and stopped inside. It was eerie. He was dressed in fine clothes, white shirt, black trousers, shoes. I watched him for a moment. He was emptying ashtrays into a wheeled trash can that he pushed around the lobby. I called out, Yuri! He didn't hear me. He was heading for a hallway at the back of the lobby. Yuri! I ran after him. When I got to the hallway, he was gone. I went down the hallway, peeking into dark rooms. Suddenly I was off my feet and flying into one of them. The door slammed shut. I couldn't see a thing, but I knew it was Yuri holding me and whispering into my ear. What are you doing here? I saw you. Ow! He was squeezing my arm. I called you. Didn't you see me? What are you doing here? He shook me. Never mind what I'm doing here. I work in the laundry. If I see you in here again, I'll tell them to shoot you. My name is not Yuri here. You never, never call me that. His hand squeezed my neck. His breath was in my face. Do you hear? I nodded, choking. Never come in here again. Get out, now. The door opened and I was flung into the bright hallway. Outside on the street, I expected to see Janina. She was usually within sight, following me, but pretending she wasn't. I didn't see her. Something inside me said, good. Something else said, I don't like this. I disappeared into my usual shadows and alleyways. I did not seek out new places on this night. I went to familiar, reliable garbage cans and a few unguarded home pantries, places we both knew well. I kept expecting to bump into her. I kept glancing around. She wasn't there. The moon, as always, had moved halfway across the sky by the time I was done with my shopping. It was full on this night. My least favorite kind of moon. Normally I dashed for the wall and practically dove through the hole. This time I stopped at the wall and waited, crouching in the shadow. I could not stay long. The wall was patrolled. Nothing but the patrols moved in Warsaw at this time of night. I kept waiting, hoping to see a tiny fragment of shadow break away and come running to the wall, to me. Somewhere on the other side of the wall, a dog barked, a whistle blew. I thought of the other boys. I hoped they were safe. Something moved down along the wall. A glint of silver in the moonlight. A patrol was coming. I stuffed my sack through the hole, then myself. A minute later, I found her. She was near a street corner. Standing still, not even trying to hide herself, her sack of food dumped on the ground beside her. I did not want to call out. I approached her quietly from behind. She did not move. She seemed to be looking at something. She was looking up, and then I saw a body was hanging from the crossbar of a street light whose lamp had long since stopped shining. It was hanging by the neck. I wondered why the hanging body had stopped her. It was not the first she had seen. Death was as familiar to us as life. Even those still breathing, walking, they looked as if they were waiting for someone to tell them they were dead. So why was my heart hammering my chest? Because the body, I could see now as I stopped beside her, had one arm. It was a boy. It was Olek. A sign was hanging across his chest. In the moonlight it was easy to see the words, but I could not read. Flat on the ground, his shadow was hanging too. Chapter 32 I was a smuggler. The next morning, Enos told me what the sign had said. They'll hang us all, he said. Not me, I said. They can't catch me. Not me, said Janina. They can't catch me. Enos laughed. We sat on rocks at the ruins of the butcher shop. No one said anything. Ferdy smoked. Kuba stared at the dust. For once, he had nothing funny to say. Big Henrik bawled. He took off his shoes and pounded the frozen earth with them. He threw away the shoes and bawled some more. I said, I saw Yuri. No one looked up. Janina spat in the dirt. I hate your angels. The next day, the first snow flurries came. Children held their faces to the sky, trying to catch flakes on their tongues. I visited the orphanage, and Dr. Korzak was teaching the children a song. When he saw me, he said, Misha, come join us. Sing with us. I stood in the middle of the children and sang the words. After the singing, we were give, each given a cabbage cake and a spoonful of fat. I never saw Dr. Corsack eat. Everyone had shoes. When I left, I walked about the 
ghetto singing my song in the snowflakes. I saw a boy eating a newspaper. A voice called, Misha Pilsudski! Misha Milgram! I recognized the voice, but I couldn't believe my ears. I turned. It was Uncle Shepsel. Since the day the Jews paraded into the ghetto, I had not seen Uncle Shepsel outside the room except for lineups. He was smiling, showing the world his brown teeth. His hand came down on my shoulder. Misha! Misha, is it not a beautiful day? I looked up. I looked around, and it seemed like any other day to me. Gray. Up the street, a man was banging his head against a stone wall. But I was an agreeable fellow. Yes, I said. Yes, yes, he looked around. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath and stood like that for a while. I thought he had gone to sleep. The head of the man up the street was red, but he was still banging. Uncle Shepsel opened his eyes and smiled down at me. I had seen the same smile in the room lately as he read the book that had changed him from a Jew to a Lutheran. He removed my cap and mussed my hair. Lice eggs flew like baby snowflakes. He replaced my cap. He nodded dreamily. Suddenly his expression changed. He seemed confused. He looked hard into my face and did not seem to know me. You go. Every night you go, he said. Why do you come back? I did not have an answer. Maybe he found it in my face, for after a while he turned and walked off. Up the street, the man was on the ground. My feet led me back to the room. Mr. Mrs. Milgram was lying on the mattress as usual, facing the wall. She looked the same in every way, and yet I knew at once that she was dead. Mr. Milgram was sitting on the edge of the mattress, and Janina was in his lap. Her face was in his chest, and she was crying. Her father rocked her back and forth. When he looked at me, his eyes were shining. Ever since Mr. Milgram had made me a member of the family, I had wanted to call Mrs. Milgram mother. I did so once, and she replied, I'm not your mother. I was confused. By the time I decided to try again, she had turned her back on the room for good, and now she was dead. And Mr. Milgram's eyes were making me sad. I put my hand on his shoulder, as Dr. Corsick had often done to me. I looked into his shining eyes and said, Tata. He took me onto his lap next to Janina, and now I was being rocked back and forth, too. I cry- tried to cry like my sister, but I was too busy looking for Mrs. Milgram's angel. We sat up all night with the body of Mrs. Milgram, except for Uncle Shepsel, who went to sleep when he returned to the room. In the morning, Mr. Milgram left and came back with the undertaker. He gave the undertaker a small bottle of white pills. He said he had been saving them for this day. He reached under the mattress and pulled out a little black bowl-shaped piece of cloth. I wondered what it was. He put it on his head, and it was a hat. The undertaker had his two helpers carry carried Mrs. Milgram down to the courtyard where a cart was waiting. Mrs. Milgram was laid in the cart and covered with a ragged scrap of cabbage-colored wool that had once been a blanket. The undertaker led the way out of the courtyard. Then came the, help, the helpers pulling the cart. Then came the three of us. Uncle Shepsel stayed back in the room. We were the smallest parade ever. There were many bodies along the way. I was surprised that we were not picking up some of them. But I was pleased also because I did not want to see Mrs. Milgram wind up on the bottom of a heap. I had never been so slow before. Even when I was not fleeing, I was running or at least walking fast. Everything I did was fast. I forced myself to keep pace with Mr. Milgram and Janina. He held my hand and I kept telling myself, my mother is dead in the cart. I must not go faster than her. We passed the orphanage, and Dr. Korzak stood in the doorway. He put his hands together and closed his eyes and said words. I could not hear them, but I could see them puff from his mouth in the winter air. Many women passed us as going the other, passed us going the other way. They all wore coats and wraps of fox and other furs. They looked very sad. Some were crying. They had been ordered to turn in all furs at Stocky Station. A man went marching past us in the street. He had no shirt or coat on, no shoes or rags on his feet. He made peeping sounds from a silver type that he held to his mouth. He waved in the, the pipe in the air and called out, Children, children, come with me. We go to the Candy Mountain. Follow me, follow me. At the gate to the cemetery on Geisha Street, Mr. Milgram gave the guard a bottle of pills, and we were let in. We went to an empty plot of ground, and the undertaker's helpers found shovels and dug a hole. A crow sat nearby on a tilting tombstone. It stared at me. I thought it spoke to me. In its croaky voice, it said the same thing over and over. I could not understand. I left Mrs. Milgram's side 
and walked toward the crow. What? I called. The crow spoke one last time and flew off. As they were laying Mrs. Milgram in her grave, the first bomb fell on the other side of the wall. I felt it in my feet, and I looked up. It was raining bombs. The ground was trembling as if all of the dead had decided to leave their graves at once. The undertaker and his helpers and the cemetery guards all ran. Mr. Milgram just stood there staring into the hole. A bomb exploded several blocks away on our side of the wall. Then more came. Mr. Milgram looked at us. Children, he said. He lifted each of us and lowered us into the hole with Mrs. Milgram. Cover your eyes. We curled around each other on the scrap of wool at the feet of Mrs. Milgram. The earth was thumping like a heart. When I peeked upward, I saw Mr. Milgram sitting on the edge of the grave hole, his feet dangling toward us. Janina pulled something from her pocket. It was a milkweed pod. She must have plucked it from the plant in the alley. It looked empty. She blew into it. Three or four puffs rose into the air. They sailed up and out of the grave, past Mr. Milgram, and into the rectangle of gray sky and the black falling teardrops of the bombs. Chapter 33 when the bombing stopped, we returned home to Uncle Shepsel shouting in the courtyard, It's the Russians! We're saved! He danced into the street. We're saved! Uncle Shepsel was only the only one dancing. Upstairs, we found other people in our room. With people being trucked into the ghetto every day, this was happening everywhere. Now it was happening to us. Janina snapped. You're in our house! Everyone stared, but no one said anything. Mr. Milgram pushed his pill cabinet and the table to one side of the room. To the people, he said, you can have the mattress. I went to find the boys. Enos was standing on the top of the butcher shop rubble. He was laughing. The others were staring up at him. What's funny, I said. What's funny? He laughed some more. Everything. They herd us in here like animals. They build a wall around us. They starve us. They freed us. us. They beat us. They shoot us. They hang us. They set us on fire. And then guess what? He reached down to Big Henrik and wrapped him on the head. Guess what? What, said Big Henrik. I'll tell you what, Enos started laughing again. The Russians come along and say that's not enough. You Nazis are too easy on them. So we're going to bomb them. And that's what they do. He threw out his arms. They bomb us. He looked at us all. You don't think that's the funniest thing you ever heard of? No one laughed, not even Cuba. Funny or not, the bombs kept falling and the winter was cold and the people were hungry. Orphans by the thousands roamed the streets in their rags and boils, slumped in doorways begging for food, clothing, anything. There was nothing to give them. So they starved and froze and died in the snow, their arms frozen up outward, still begging. The children who lived were all scraps and eyes. This was the ghetto where children grew down instead of up. I couldn't believe there had been a time when the boys and I had wrestled in piles of food. One day Janina and I heard a commotion in the courtyard, and we looked down from the window. A jackboot and his girlfriend were standing in the entrance. The man had a bag. He was pulling pieces of bread from the bag and tossing them onto the snow. Every time he tossed a piece, ten people pounced on it. The soldier and his girlfriend laughed. They called other couples to come and watch and laugh with them. I saw one girlfriend who did not laugh. If only lice were food. Every morning we awoke with eye eyelashes gunked with lice. They made a pop and squirted red when we squeezed them between thumb and fingernail. Every day the man with the silver pipe marched up and down the streets. Come to the Candy Mountain! Once I saw a boy stagger after him, but the piper was going too fast. With the new people in the room, Janina and I could no longer leave our smuggled food on the table. When we returned each night, we slipped food into the coat pockets of Mr. Milgram and Uncle Shepsel as they slept. There were seven new people. Five were adults, two were little twin boys. The adults never spoke to Uncle Shepsel or Mr. Milgram, but the twin boys came to Janina and me, and we were playing pickup sticks. They tried to play, but they were too little to do it right. They made Janina laugh. She began to leave a piece of potato or onion under the noses at night. There was even less food now since the bombing by the Russians. It had gone on for many days. Most of the bombs had fallen on heaven. The clang of the trolleys was gone. The colors were gone, except for the glowing blue line of the camel. We smuggled every night. On our way over, Janina stayed far behind. Sometimes I turned quickly to catch sight of her, but there were only shadows. It was her game. 
Then we had an unexpected holiday. As I was nearing the hole in the wall one night, I heard a sound. I looked. There was something on the ground. I picked it up. It was a cabbage, a firm, fine one. Suddenly more things were falling at my feet. Sausages and potatoes. By now Janina was with me, scooping them up. Somebody's throwing food over the wall, I said in wonder. We stood there looking up, but nothing else came down. We ran home with the food, giggling all the way. The next night we were ready as the food came flying over the wall again. This happened night after night. Tins of sardines and herring, fruit and babkas of all flavors. More than anything, we loved seeing the astonished faces of Mr. Milgram and Uncle Shepsa when we returned with our nightly feast. And then just as suddenly the flying food stopped. We were back on our own. We always met on the other side. If she didn't find me searching for food, she would be waiting for me at the two brick hole. We always came back through the wall together, me first, then her, ever since the night we found Olick. Until the night, I couldn't fit back through the hole. First I took off my coat and stuffed it through the hole. I still couldn't get through. I panicked. I tore off my pants and jammed myself into the hole and didn't stop until I was through. I reached back for my pants and redressed myself, but Janina was already laughing so hard her cabbages were rolling across the ground. The next day at the butcher shop, I found a good bone among the charred bricks and handed it to Big Henrik and said, Beat me. Big Henrik was confused. I knew he wouldn't understand. I'm getting too big, I said to Enos. I lay on the ground on my back. I raised the bottoms of my feet to Big Henrik. Beat my feet, I told him. I need to stop growing. Enos laughed. Beat him, he said. If you don't, I will. Big Henrik's first wallop sent me skidding over the frozen ground like a sled on ice. Everyone laughed. Enos pushed against my shoulders to keep me from sliding. He told Big Henrik to beat away. Big Henrik was beating away on the soles of my feet when I heard the moo. We all heard it. I couldn't believe it. All along I had been on the lookout for the cow. I so wanted to please Dr. Korzak. And now here it was, plain to hear as a flop's whistle. But it didn't sound right. It was nearby. We ran to the street to a courtyard. There it was, galloping across a balcony, a flaming fiery cow, screaming, while a jackboot behind it laughed, and the flamethrower wretched more fire until the cow plunged through the railing and sailed through the air, flames flapping like wings to the ground. One person ran across the courtyard to the burning cow, and then it was mobbed. Chapter 34 This year you will celebrate with us, said Mr. Milgram. He meant the holiday called Hanukkah. It was the first Jewish word I had learned. He had wanted to include me the year before, but Mrs. Milgram would not allow it. No, she had said, groaning from her mattress. He is not a Jew. I am not his mother. She is not herself, Mr. Milgram had said. Still, I was not allowed. For eight nights I had sat in a corner and watched. Now it was Hanukkah time again, and Mrs. Milgram was gone, and Uncle Shepsel had walked outside, being a Lutheran now, and I was in. On the first day, Mr. Milgram told me the story of Hanukkah. How long ago the Greeks needed to dis try to destroy everything Jewish. See, this is not the first time. How the Jews were outnumbered, and I had no choice against the Greeks, but and had no choice against the Greeks, but beat them anyway. How the Jews celebrated by lighting an oil lamp, but the celebration would have to be short because there was only enough oil to last for one day, and then a miracle happened. The oil lasted for eight days. And so Hanukkah is eight days when we remember that time, and we remember to be happy and proud to be Jews, and that we will always survive. This is our time. We celebrate ourselves. We must be happy now. We must never forget how to be happy. Never forget. Happy. I had not heard that word since Mr. Milgram spoke it at the last Hanukkah. I asked him the question that had been on my mind since then. Tata, what is happy? He looked at me at the and at the ceiling and back to me. Did you ever taste an orange, he said? No, I said, but I heard of them. Are they real? Ah, oh, never mind. He stared at me some more. Did you ever? He stopped and shook his head. After more staring, he said, Were you ever cold? And then you were warm. I thought of sleeping with the boys under the braided, tuck, braided rug, cold, then warm. Yes, I blurted. Was that happy? He smiled. That was happy. I felt again the cuddled tent of warmth. Sometimes I would stick my nose out to better feel the warmth on the rest of me. Under the rug. No, he said. He tapped my chest. Happy is here. 
He tapped his own chest. Here. I looked down past my chin. Inside? Inside. It was getting crowded in there. First angel. Now happy. It seemed there, were more, there, was, more, there was more to me than cabbage and turnips. I looked at Janina sitting potato-faced on the floor. She hadn't smiled since the burning cow. Janina does not have happy. He squeezed my shoulder. He smiled sadly. No. Mr. Milgram took the silver candle holder from the pill cabinet and lit the first of eight candles. The twins came over to stare at the flame. The other new people stayed on their side of the room. Gunshots echoed in the streets as Mr. Milgram said words over the candle flames. The flame gave a faint yellow tint to his frozen breath, and he sang a song. Sing, Janina, he said, but Janina only gave a grunt or two. Then he pulled Janina and me to our feet, and the twins also, and he made us all hold hands, and we danced in a circle. While Mr. Milgram sang, and the candle flame quivered, and somebody screamed in the night. The smile never left Mr. Milgram's face. I copied his smile as best I could. Janina's shoulders slumped, and her shoes dragged across the floor. I wondered if the orphans were dancing in the circle. Then Mr. Milgram took something, and another something, from his coat pocket. They were wrapped in newspaper. He gave one to Janina and one to me. I tore mine open. It was a comb. I couldn't believe it. I remembered the canister full of combs in the barber shop. I remembered Yuri combing my hair. Now I had my very own. I threw off my cap and the comb like a spade into my hair. It stuck. I pulled. I couldn't move it. I dropped the comb and began tearing apart the thatch of hair with my fingers. I tried the comb again. Using all my strength, I was finally able to pull the comb through my hair. I could feel the lice and their eggs peppering the back of my neck. I heard them ticking onto the floor. In the light of the candle, I combed and combed and combed my hair. Not until the next day did I notice that Janina's gift was still wrapped in newspaper. You're not going to open it, I said. She pouted, no. So I opened it. It was a comb just like mine. I gave it to her. She threw it on the floor. I picked it up and began combing her curly brown hair. See, I said, doesn't that feel good? And it's better than picking out lice with our fingers. She did not answer. She did not smile. She did not stop me from combing. On the second day of Hanukkah, when Mr. Milgram went for the silver candle holder, it was gone. Mr. Milgram seemed surprised, but I wasn't. In my world, things existed to be stolen. With the other family in the room, everyone knew who did it, and why. If you knew who to deal with, things could be traded for money, and money could be traded for food. Mr. Milgram accused no one. He simply looked out the window and said loud enough for all in the room to hear, What a shame when Jew will steal from Jew. He found a candle stub and lit the tiny wick with a match. He looked at Janina and me. Who will be the menorah? The menorah was the candle holder. I will, I said. He gave me the candle. He made for it a collar of newspaper so the hot wax would not drip on my hand. I stood at attention and held my arms out and did my best to imitate a menorah. Mr. Milgram said the words and sang. I asked him if I could sing the song I learned at Dr. Korzak's orphanage. His eyes glistened in the light from my candle. Yes, yes. So I sang my song, a singing candle holder, and Mr. Milgram and the twins danced in a circle and laughed. Janina refused to get up from the floor. So the days of Hanukkah went. When the candle burned away, Mr. Milgram stuck a match and said that maybe it would last for eight days, like the oil in the story. But it burned away before he finished speaking. So, he said, we ourselves will be the candle flames. He put his hands on his chest. Feel your hearts, how warm they are. And I did. I could feel my heart getting warm. I could feel the flame in my chest as we danced in a circle. Each night I went out for food, but Janina stayed behind. She never left the room. She never spoke. She even stopped complaining. I combed her hair for hours each day, but I could not comb a smile onto her face. I also was losing my happy. Then an idea came to me. Although Janina did not like her comb, I knew of something that she would like very much. Almost every time she ate, I heard her mutter, I wish I had a pickled egg. I knew about pickled herring, but not pickled eggs. I thought, I'll find an egg and a pickle. There was only one day of Hanukkah left. That night when I went to the other side, I forgot about everything else. I cannot remember seeing an egg in my smuggling searches. 
but then I hadn't been looking for eggs. I knew eggs were kept in cool places, so I looked in ice boxes and basements and went to all my best houses plus the Blue Camel Hotel and found not, found not a single egg. As for pickles, I was hoping for the fat, juicy kind that Erie used to eat, but the best I could do was a jar of pickle spears in someone's pantry. I was traveling light this night, so I just took a couple of spears from the jar and put them in my pocket. Now, all I needed was an egg. It had begun to snow. I lurked down the alleyways, jig jiggling strange doors and windows, trying to get in somewhere. There were more ruins now, after the Russians bombing. Parts of heaven were beginning to look like the ghetto. At last I found an egg, not in a great house, but in a shoemaker's shop, and not in an ice box, but sitting on a scrap of leather on a workbench. I cradled the egg in my hand, and I knew how fragile they were. I could already hear Janina's joyful squeal. On the way back out on the street, I heard a whistle blast. I thought nothing of it. The jackboots were after someone. The whistle kept getting louder, and then a shouting voice, Jude! Jude! I didn't understand. No one ever stopped me over here. I ran. A second voice was shouting. Snowflakes pelted my face. I kept my fingers loose about the egg. I could not run in a straight line, for there were craters in the streets from the bombing, and I could not lead them to the hole in the wall. I darted into an alley and into the shadows and deep into a heap of rubble. I crouched, panting, pressing the cold, smooth egg to my lips. The shouts and whistles grew faint. I waited for a long time. The snow piled on my hat and collar. I could smell the pickles in my pocket. I warmed the egg with my breath. The sky was turning from black to gray when I made my way back to the two-brick hole. I reached to the other side and laid the egg in the snow and wiggled after it. I had been having no problems getting through lately. Big Henrik's walloping must have worked. The moment I returned to the ghetto side, I realized why the jackboots had been after me. I, for I had forgotten to take off my armband. I had been announcing to all of Warsaw, Look, I'm a Jew. Escape from the ghetto. It was a wonder they hadn't noticed me sooner. Darkness, my friend, was leaving. I had to hurry. I ran, dashing around a corner. I tripped over a body half hidden in the snow and went sprawling on the sidewalk. The egg flew from my hand. At first I was happy for the pillow of snow, but when I picked up the egg I saw in the dim light that the shell was cracked. I was heartbroken, all the dangers it had survived only to come to this. And then I noticed that it was only cracked, not broken apart. There was no yellow sne seeping into the snow. I didn't understand, an egg that cracked but didn't break. It was a miracle. I ran the rest of the way, veering around bodies. Mr. Milgram was already awake when I got home. Janina was sleeping. I showed him the egg and the pickle spears. For Janina, I whispered, happy. He looked at the egg and pickle spears, but he no long he looked longer at me. Look at the egg, I said. It doesn't break. Is it a miracle? He studied the egg. He held it to his ear and shook it. He no he nodded. No, he whispered. The miracle is you. The egg is hard boiled. It will not break. A hard boiled egg. That was new to me. I hoped Janina would like it. That night I gave it to her. Her eyes bulged like bird's eyes. Bird's eggs. She peeled off the shell and shoved the whole egg into her mouth. She closed her eyes and made little sounds as she ate it. Wait, I said. Pickles. I held them out. Pickled egg. She waved the pickles away. Pickled eggs are purple, she mumbled through the mush in her mouth. The twins were staring. Their teeth were going up and down with hers. When she finished eating the egg, she hugged her father and said thank you. Thank Misha, he said. It was his idea. He found it on the other side. She hugged me. I was surprised she could squeeze so hard. Uncle Shepsel returned. He came to the room only to eat and sleep now. He believed that the less time he spent with Jews, the more Lutheran he became. But even Lutherans get hungry, and when he came to the door, in the door, he sniffed the air, and he said, Pickles. To my surprise, Mr. Milgram took a pickle spear from his pocket and gave it to Uncle Shepsel. As for me, I had been awake too long. I lay down. I felt a comb in my hair. Combing. Combing. Chapter 35. Spring. What's that? Janina said. She went to the window. The twins ran after her. We were in the room. It was day. There were voices outside the window. I joined the others. In the courtyard below, children were singing. They sounded more like crows than like children. 
When they sensed we were watching from above, they turned their faces up to us, all rags and eyes. Why are they singing, I said. Mr. Milgram's voice came over my shoulder. They, ate hung they are hungry. They are singing for food. We have no food, I said. This was true. When Janina and I returned from heaven each night, she was going out with me again. We dropped something through the window of Dr. Korzak's orphanage and brought the rest straight home and ate it at once. Come away from the window, children, said Mr. Milgram. The singing in the courtyard went on for a while, then it went away. The flies were always singing. The days were warm and the bo bodies were cold and the flies were singing and drinking at the eyes and boils of the children. No one took from the bodies under the newspapers as there were no clothes left to take, no shoes, only rags. I believed I saw angels lurking behind the eyes of the living, waiting. Angels and crows passed each other, one leaving, the other coming. Every day a parade of body wagons backed up at the Geisha Street gate of the cemetery. Smugglers hung like sad fruits from lampposts with signs around their necks. The piper marched up and down the streets and blew his silver flute and cried out, Come to the Candy Mountain! On Sundays, the jackboots came with their girlfriends to pinch their noses and take pictures and toss pieces of bread to, the, to us pigeons. One soldier made the others laugh. He wore a clothespin on his nose. Food was harder and harder to find, even in heaven. Sometimes all I could find was green bread. Sometimes there was nothing in a garbage can but drop drippings of fat in the bottom. I had no container, so I scooped two handfuls and returned with that. The others ate the fat from my hands, even with smuggled food. Janina had gotten thinner and thinner. Her face had become as thin as a fox's. While the rest of, the, of her became smaller, her eyes grew lo larger. In other ways, Janina was her old self again, chattering, complaining, shadowing me everywhere I went. In everything I did, she made me self-conscious. I, I hesitated to do things that had always come naturally. I had stopped harassing Buffalo so that Janina would also stop, but it didn't work. In fact, she went even further. She became a gnat in the nose of every flop she saw. She called them names. She threw stones. She sneaked up behind them and whacked them on the backs of their knees with a metal pipe. I smacked her. I shouted at her, but I could not change her. I could not understand her moods, her outbursts. I mostly accepted the world as I found it. She did not. She smacked me back and kicked me. In time, I found my own best way to deal with her. On many days, I went off to a favorite bomb crater and lowered myself into it and licked traces of fat from between my fingers and closed my eyes and remembered the good old days when ladies walked from bakeries with bulging bags of bread. <laughs>